Good morning and welcome to the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization and Space Coast Area Transit's ADA and bus stop accessibility training. We're glad you can join us today virtually. I'm Sarah Crom. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner with the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization and will be your host today. Just as in case you are unfamiliar with the GoToWebinar platform, in order to reduce background noises, all attendees are currently muted. We will unmute you when we get to the field visit sections that people can, can discuss and communicate through the training. Please use the hand raise function when appropriate. Today's meeting is being recorded. You are also welcome to use the question box to comment or ask questions throughout the session as well. We will be taking questions throughout the session as well as have a question and answer period at the very end of the webinar. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Terry Jordan to introduce himself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Jordan um, with Space School Area Transit. As you see on the screen, I'm the interim director, but previously served as the transit planner for Space School Area Transit. And that's where my involvement comes in. I work very closely with Sir uh, and the TPO previously on the uh, bus stop ADA assessment, along with Brian and the Tindy Lover team. And um, also work closely with our county attorney's office with uh, bench vendors that are looking to do um, construction projects for advertising benches within the county and our shelter projects as well. So that's more or less my involvement in uh, this, this meeting. And uh, thank you everyone for taking your time of your busy days to attend and, um, and learn as much as you can as far as making sure our stops are compliant and any other uh, areas of your, your, your dealings with such things. Thank you. All right, thank you, Terry. And I will turn it over to Brian and Amanda to introduce themselves. My name is Brian Weinstein. I'm going to be one of the speakers today. I work with Tyndall and Associates as the director of our ADA Compliance and Accessibility Service Division. I've got 18 years of experience. I'm a civil engineer and I'm also certified through the International Code Council as an accessibility inspector and plans examiner. Uh, over the course of my career, I performed ADA trainings for FTOT. I have also done uh, assessments of bus stops and sidewalks uh, for Space Coast Area Transit, as well as other municipalities looking at the accessibility of their parks and their buildings, and developing transition plans to make sure that all infrastructure can be compliant for everybody. Good morning, my name is Amanda Herrig, and I've been an ADA planner with Tyndale Oliver for about three years now. Um, I graduated from USF with my master's in urban and regional planning, and I'm also a certified International Code Council Accessibility Inspector and Plans Examiner. Thank you, Brian and Amanda. So we are going to be utilizing Mentimeter throughout the presentation to help create a more interactive training in our virtual setting. So if you're unfamiliar with Mentimeter, you can use your computer, tablet, or cell phone. And basically you just go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And then you'll be entering a code that is 74429056. 74429056. And just give me a second here. So we are going to do just a couple of mentee questions to get ourselves set up this morning and so that Brian and Amanda can learn more about who the audience is today so that we can hopefully better serve you in the training. So our first question is Please sign in by entering your location with city and state because we have people registered from all over today. And we'll just give you guys a few minutes to get set up. Once again, you go to menti.com and use the code 74429056. The code is also in the chat box.
All right. Well, we are slowing down on people logging on to Menti. Um, it looks like the bulk of people are in Florida and mostly in um, Tampa and Cape Canaveral and Melbourne today. Oh, Titusville's coming up as well. So um, we also have Massachusetts, South Carolina, North Carolina. So thanks everyone for joining us this, this morning. All right, our next mentee question is what best describes your role? So are you a planner? Are you an engineer? Are you a transit user? Are you a member of a committee or board and feel this is a relevant um, topic or are you other, something else? <laughs> For those just joining us, um, we are utilizing Menti, and you just need a cell phone, tablet, or um, computer, and you go on to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com, and the code is 74429056. All right, so it looks like we mostly have, have planners today, so if you're the other, if you want to let us know in the chat box or um, question box, what specifically you that entails, we, that would be appreciated. All right, we have just, we have two more questions before we get started. Um, how often do you use transit? How often do you use transit? Is it, do you never use it? You're just an interested party, um, once or twice a year, once or twice a month, week, daily? I always find this question so interesting because, you know, as, as many of us are transit planners or work with transit and a lot of us don't ride the bus very often. So it looks like that's the case here. So we mostly have nevers, couple once or twice a year. We have three dailies, that's awesome. All right, and then our final question before we get started with our presentation is how comfortable are you with ADA standards and compliance? What's ADA? Somewhat comfortable, comfortable, very comfortable. Looks like we're mostly in the somewhat comfortable, comfortable range. Hopefully we'll get more of you in the very comfortable and hopefully we won't have anyone in what's ADA at the end of the presentation. So we will use Menti a couple more times throughout the day, so don't close out that browser. And with that, I'm just gonna switch back over to our presentation and turn it over to Brian and Amanda. Hello everyone. Um, nice to see you all here today. Um, I'm going to get started with the objectives and work our way through half of the slideshow, and then Brian will take over from there. Um, SCOUT has an inventory of over 1,000 bus stops, and they were all assessed for ADA compliance by Tyndale Oliver. The county and cities have been coordinating with bench advertising companies to provide seating at various stops throughout the service area. SCOUT is encouraging the municipalities to require that the bench advertising agencies at a minimum install an ADA compliant boarding and a lighting pad along with the pad that they're pouring for the bench. To ensure that the new advertising benches and associated boarding and alighting pads are placed in an ADA compliant manner, the TPO and SCAT felt it would be beneficial to hold this training to ensure that everyone fully understands what is required to be ADA compliant and how to make sure that the submitted plans follow these standards. This training will include a brief overview of the ADA and what it entails, how the, it impacts public transit, and finally, the features of an ADA accessible bus stop. Um, we will provide you with further details regarding the boarding and alighting areas, the benches, and also shelters located at bus stops.
and what is the ADA? So the basic purpose of the ADA is that no entity shall discriminate against an individual with a disability in connection with the provision of transportation service. Essentially, the ADA is a civil rights law, uh, much like the laws in the 1960s that outlaw discrimination based on race, religion, or gender, but it, at that time, it failed to mention people with disabilities. Since the ADA mandates equal access to transit for people with disabilities, generally every bus stop built after or modified after 1992 must be wheelchair accessible. Therefore, if a person qualified under the ADA cannot access a bus stop because a bus stop is not ADA compliant, this could be in violation of their civil rights. Just some background on the ADA. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 is a federal civil rights law that became effective in 1992. And there is also another version released in 2010 that became effective in 2012. The civil rights laws in the 1960s did not address people with disabilities, and it only took a couple decades for the Congress to get this law going and realize their oversight and adopted the ADA. In addition to the ADA, subsequent le legislation, guidelines, and updates have also been issued. PROAG, which is the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines, has not been adopted yet, but some of the elements of PROAG have been integrated into other codes that we use today. State requirements, such as the FDOT Accessibility Code, can be more restrictive than the ADA, so it is important to look at all applicable codes when building a bus stop. Some ADA features to consider include keeping in mind the location in relation to its surroundings. As you can see on the right, there's a bus stop along the roadway, and it has an accessible route in other directions, as well as to the shopping center in the back of the image. And as we'll talk about later, having a stop that's ADA compliant doesn't help if users cannot access it and vice versa. If the area is compliant, but the bus stop is not, then it's still not helpful to the users. It is important to reconsider the accessible route, including the sidewalks, curb ramps, and crosswalks leading to the bus stop. And if amenities are provided like a shelter, trash cans, benches, B route signage, those must also be made compliant. Boarding and alighting pads are one of the most important parts of an ADA accessible bus stop. Their minimum size is five feet parallel and eight feet perpendicular. And the ADA requires that all bus stops have sufficient space for the B&A area that has a firm, stable, and slip resistant surface. And the B&A area must be able to be accommodated at the stop. It should also not be obstructed by any physical features such as a utility pole, any stop amenities, trash can, bike rack, bench, or advertising displays and it should be connected to an ADA accessible path. And in Florida, that means that the path is four feet wide as that is the most stringent requirement. And ADA regulations require that when establishing a new or altered route with new bus stop locations, the public transit provider, if not obstruct constructing them with the current bus stop plan, must consider the future construction of boarding and alighting areas. Meaning that an agency should try to locate each bus stop so that the boarding and alighting area will fit in the selected location. And an accessible route can be provided to it sometime in the future, either connecting to an existing accessible route or creating a brand new accessible route. For a bus stop designated by only a sign on a post and no other amenities, shelter, trash can, signs, and where complimentary ADA paratransit service is provided, the boarding and alighting area is still required. However, it doesn't have to be a concrete pad. But if it is provided, the concrete pad must be located within the specified clear zone for the roadway environment being used, according to the FDOT design standards in index 700. For a rural stop, except for the area adjacent to the race curb, the area surrounding the B&A area shall be flush with the adjacent shoulder and side slopes and designed to be transversible by errant vehicles. And the image to the right shows an ADA accessible bus stop with the five foot by eight foot boarding and alighting area, also the ADA compliant sidewalk lift, and an ADA compliant shelter and bench. So the accessible routes are very important as we covered earlier, that if users can get to the bus stop or cannot get to the bus stop, that really affects the accessibility. Accessible routes shall be 36 inches wide or three feet wide throughout, except for where it is accessible, acceptable to be reduced to width of 32 inches for a length of 24 inches. 
So as you can see in the bottom graphic, there's a utility pole in the center of the accessible route. And at that point, the width can be reduced to 32 inches for the length of the utility pole. There must be enough space for a wheelchair user or person using a walker to comfortably navigate the sidewalk. And there shall be no protrusions below 80 inches into the accessible route. The image in the upper right shows the shelter at a height of 80 inches. And not only is this a hazard to people who have visual disabilities, but it could also be a hazard for cyclists or other users of the, of the accessible route. Furthermore, the amenities also cannot obstruct the accessible route. So as you can see, the trash cans and the newspaper rack, while they are accessible, they're off the route. They're not on the sidewalk. And these are some features of an accessible urban bus stop. Um, we can talk again about the boarding and a lighting area, and that must be five feet by eight feet. It has to be level, which um, maximum slope of 2% in all directions. Firm, stable, and slip resistant surface, ideally concrete, and it should be behind a six inch raised curb. Amenities, while not required to be present at a bus stop, must also be compliant if they are present at the bus stop. The connecting pathways must be the appropriate width as shown in the previous slide and they must not present any tripping hazards or protruding objects. The bus stop signage must be present and labeled appropriately, and the curb ramps must be the appropriate slope and have high contrast detectable warnings on them. And we'll talk more about curb ramps later in the presentation. And this is an example of a flush shoulder um, boarding and a lighting area bus stop. Um, as you can see, the curb is built up and the boarding and lighting area is connected to the sidewalk via a, a ramp. And the bench and the grass, which is clearly not compliant, in this case, it, we can assume that it is a good compliant bus stop because there are two benches in the shelter that we can assume are compliant from the image. The sidewalk ramp connecting from the boarding and the lighting area is level with the roadway. And as you can see, the curb is ramped against the roadway, and that's to help out of control drivers, like we discussed earlier. And this is an example of an, another example of an ADA compliant bus stop. You can see that the schedule is located near the concrete um, that allows users to be able to read the routes. And as route signage will be discussed later, it lists all the stops where multiple routes stop. So if someone is hard of hearing, they can look at the schedule and see when the next bus that they need arrives. And then also if someone is visually impaired, the bus itself should give external stop announcements alerting users that they're getting on the wrong vehicle or the right vehicle. And this is an example of an incompliant bus stop located at Vieira in, um, at the Walmart. Um, and as you can see, it's a flush shoulder stop with only a sign, which is technically ac accessible according to FDOT, as long as paratransit service is available. However, we suggest paving, there we go, paving a sidewalk connection and adding a raised curb or even relocating the bus stop closer to the corner to give more accessibility to the existing route. And this option with the open culvert could be more costly um, to go over the open culvert and use more concrete to cover that. And this is the first option for making this stop ADA compliant. And this is a second option for making the same stop ADA compliant that avoids going over the open culvert and gives users a closer route to the Walmart. Because as you can see, the route connects directly to the corner, leaning to the sidewalk connecting to the Walmart. This is another image of an incompliant bus stop. Um, as you can see, there's no boarding and a lighting pad, and therefore the bench is incompliant, and then also this route signage is inaccessible. Um, so what we would suggest here is building a stable, firm, and slip-resistant boarding and a lighting area. And then that would make the bench accessible as well as the sign. So it could look something like this. And this bus stop in particular is located at Lake Washington. 
and at the Wickham gas station. All right, and uh, this is Brian again. So as Amanda mentioned, having a raised curb is not a requirement of having an 80 compliant bus stop, uh, but having it is beneficial uh, because it really depends on what type of buses you currently have, what type of buses you might have in the future. And that's because having uh, the raised curb helps reduce the slope of the ramp at the bus. So as you can see in this diagram, if you were to have a lift, it doesn't really matter whether or not there is a raised curb because the people would get on the lift and the slope of, of the lift is going to be consistent regardless of the curb or not. However, if you have ramps on your buses, having the raised curb will help reduce the slope of, of the ramp. And as you can see in the next picture, uh, there is no curb, so the slope is steeper. And ideally, you would have as shallow of a slope as possible um, you know, on your buses to make things more accessible for everybody. So as Amanda mentioned, if you were to have a flush shoulder bus stop or a bus stop at a flush shoulder and there's no amenities, according to FDOT, as long as paratransit is provided at that location, then it's not required to have a firm, stable, slip resistant bus stop or boarding a lighting area. Um, I, I really, we should clarify the slide, a BNA area is still required, but it doesn't need to be cement, it doesn't need to be asphalt, it could be grass as long as it's still there. And Again, this is not ideal, but this would allow people uh, who are unable to access this bus stop use paratransit to go and access the service. But as Amanda mentioned, we do like to go and try to encourage our clients to pave a boarding lighting area uh, because that does make things more accessible for everybody. It reduces the number of people on paratransit, which is also more expensive than if they were on fixed route and gives people more mobility um, and also makes it uh, the bus stop more accessible and, and better for everybody, even choice riders who would have an option whether or not they are going to be on riding transit or not. So this next uh, picture is at a location where the firm stable slip resistant boarding lighting area may not necessarily be required if pair transit is available because it's a flush shoulder roadway. Uh, but as you can see in this location, we have a raised curb. You have the firm, stable, slip resistant uh, level boarding and lighting area. And then in this case, we have a ramp which goes forwards and backwards, uh, which leads to another flat area and then to the shoulder roadway, which would be where people would uh, use to, to access the bus stop in locations where there is no sidewalk. Uh, the one thing that this picture is missing is detectable warnings, which should be located over here and over here, which would be at the transition between the roadway, the shoulder area, and then the uh, the cement bus stop, and that would alert people with a visual impairment that they're about to enter a hazardous uh, vehicular area. And so the detectable warnings, uh, the ADA has different specifications as to how high they be, need to be, but they need to be um, you know 24 inches deep from the back of the curb. They need to be the entire width of the curb ramp. Um, curb ramps, you know, again, need to be, have an 8.3% slope, I need to have level landings, and all that is shown in the other um, picture is just oriented slightly differently. And one other thing too is detectable warnings need to be uh, high contrast. So if you have a um, you know black asphalt and you want to make sure that the detectable warnings are yellow or red, which you know that way they can uh, be seen by people who are visually impaired a lot easier. Uh, one place that we see where they're not high contrast typically are, are in more historic areas where you have like a red brick sidewalk. And then sometimes they have red detectable warnings, which are not high contrast and, and people with visual impairments, even people without visual impairments have difficulty seeing them properly. So over here we have some examples of different curb ramps and detectable warnings, or in some cases, lack of curb ramps and detectable warnings. Uh, the first picture over here, you can see it's kind of faded uh, red which is generally high contrast, although there is sand over here that could present uh, a mobility impairment to somebody um, you know, walking or, or somebody who is trying to see the detectable warnings because the sand is blocking them. These other two pictures are locations where there probably should be curb ramps, uh, but there are not curb ramps currently. 
So back to boarding and lighting areas. Uh, in some locations where you have a sidewalk, it, it's, in my mind, relatively easy to go and pave a compliant boarding line area. In, in this case, all you'd really have to do to get that five foot by eight foot section would be to pave a small section of the grass here, and that can connect to the sidewalk, and the boarding line area can't overlap with the sidewalk. In this particular example, the sidewalk is slightly below the top of the curb, so if that's the case, then we just pave a small ramp up, and then you can have your level boarding line area and a small ramp back, ramp back down to connect to the existing sidewalk. When you're doing this, you need to make sure that the slope of the, what I'm calling the ramp, although it's technically not a ramp, it would be a, a maximum 5% slope. Anything that's greater than a 5% slope is considered a ramp, and then there's other ADA requirements that need to be taken into consideration, such as level landings, um, if you're to build it that way. And in this case, the top of the sidewalk is below or is above the top of the curb. So in this case, you pave the boarding line area and you pave a slope of a maximum 5% from the sidewalk down to the boarding line area and then back up again. All right, thank you, Brian. So we are going to hop over to our Mentimeter and have kind of a follow-up question that's an open-ended question because basically what we're doing is throughout the presentation, getting, giving you all the skills that you would need to assess a bus stop. And so we will assess two bus stops at the end. So if you could maybe, in um, Mentimeter, tell us what are some of the characteristics you just heard of an ADA compliant boarding and a lighting pad. So we have five by eight. So any any of the characteristics that uh, we heard: level pad, stable firm surface, sloped, five by eight the slope onto the bus right yep with our with your curb max cross slope two percent connection to destination areas level sidewalk connections accessibility <clears throat> level firm and curbing detectable warning surface all right, so it looks like looks like we can move on. Thank you guys for participating in the Menti. And I will turn it back over to Brian. And then I'd also like to remind you that if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box and we can go and address them as we're covering the topic that you had a question about um, you know, right now. Uh, so now we're going to move on to bus stop shelters. And so one thing that's important to remember about the shelters is that you need to have a wheelchair accessible space within it. Uh, you know, we call it a 30 by 48 inch space. So if you have a space for an able-bodied person to sit down in the shelter or to take refuge in the shelter, you need to make sure you also have that space available for somebody in a wheelchair. Uh, now, another you know, a few other items, you know, Amanda mentioned about the um, the clear width. Uh, so a, a shelter needs to have, uh, if it has a doorway of some sort, uh, not like this one where it has a wide open space, but, you know, more of a smaller door than 36 inches wide is a minimum requirement. Obviously wider is better. Uh, the boarding line area is allowed to extend into the shelter. It looks like in this case, the boarding line area is, uh, you know, just before the shelter, but in some cases you have larger shelters and it goes inside of there and that can, overlap the 30 by 48 inch space if you really need to, although ideally it would not touch that. Uh, if there's any sort of obstructions, uh, Amanda was discussing the heights earlier, but then there's also obstructions at, at the base, uh, tripping hazards that cannot be more than a quarter of inch, they, or they could be a half an inch as long as they're beveled. When um, you're building shelters, also make sure you take into consideration any sort of setback requirements uh, for the specific municipality, whether it's FDOT, or uh, local county municipalities. Um, although I know we have a lot of people from, uh, I think we, it said Raleigh, from Delaware, from Massachusetts, so I'm sure you have uh, setback requirements as well. 
there was one example in Polk County that happened a few years ago where they built all the different shelters and they unfortunately built them too close to the roadway and it was never caught on plans review. But once they uh, were inspecting them after the pads have already been built and the shelters were in place, that's when somebody found out that they were all built too close and so everything had to be relocated. And now there's these large unsightly pads that the shelter was at and then a connection to the the new shelter uh, further back from the roadway because it was a high speed road. So, you know, again, we're going to talk about plans review later on in the presentation, but making sure that things are built appropriately uh, for the different municipalities. And one other thing I'd like to point out in this picture is that in this case, we have the schedule and it's facing away from the bus stop and it's not really adjacent uh, to the to the asphalt or, or to the cement. And as something like this, if it were turned the other direction or if it is located a little bit closer to the borderline area, to the sidewalk, then it would be more useful to everybody. And then lastly, having the sign on the uh, the upstream, or I'm sorry, on the downstream side of the borderline area, it's again, it's not a requirement, but it is something that a lot of agencies have a, um, a policy where the front of the bus will stop at the front of the sign. And that way the doors are located in the same location, regardless of which driver is driving the bus. And you can always be assured where the boarding line area is going to be located at uh, because of that, that policy. So here's an example of a, a compliant uh, shelter in Brevard County. This one is at uh, 520 in Kiwanis. So as you can see here, you have a bench, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. You have what appears to be a, a compliant uh, wheelchair accessible space, uh, the boarding light area, and these are all the same picture, is over in this location in front of the bus shelter. You have uh, the amenities that are accessible. One thing I really like about this one is they have the bike racks, uh, but I've seen far too often where the bike racks are in such a location where when people put bikes on them and lock them in place, now somebody in a wheelchair is not necessarily, or even someone not in a wheelchair, is not able to access the boarding line area. And in this case, you can see they're pretty far away, so you shouldn't have any issues with the bikes being attached to this location and still having uh, an appropriate location uh, you know, to the boarding line area. Now back to Sarah. All right, so now we're going to review bus stop shelters. So same thing, um, you just can type into the mentee meter and we would like to hear some of the characteristics of an ADA compliant bus shelter. So what are some of the characteristics you just heard? Enough space for one wheelchair, minimum 80 foot, 80 inch height, 80 foot height would be really, really, really tall, um, space for wheelchair, 30 by 48, shelter should not block the ped path, clear space of 30 by 48, room for accessibility, nothing blocking, sign adjacent to pavement, and also, just as a reminder, while you guys are typing into the Mentimeter, in the handout section on GoTo, there is a copy of the PowerPoint if you wanted to download it and, um, and share it with anyone or reference it later. Set back, proper distance away from street. Very good. All right. I am going to turn it back over to Brian. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm trying to turn my camera back on, but the mouse keeps moving. So for bus stop signs, we talked about them briefly in a couple different locations. There are requirements for the signage itself. Uh, the font heights need to be a specific height depending on how high the sign is mounted. You need to have um, the route numbers on the sign at locations where more than one uh, bus stop route is stopping. and uh, I think Amanda kind of discussed this briefly. If you have a person with a, a visual impairment, then the bus 
at these locations would be making stop announcements saying the route of the bus and where they're headed to. If a person has um, you know, trouble hearing, then they would be looking at the sign to identify which uh, routes would stop at this particular location. However, if only one bus stop route, route stops at that location, then that stuff is it's beneficial to have, but it's not a requirement to go in and have the additional items like that. Uh, so having, you know, high contrast signage, you know, dark uh, letters and, and light signage or, or vice versa is also beneficial for people with visual impairments. Uh, a unique design is also beneficial too. As you can see over here, Space Coast Area Transit has the around sign, which is uh, more unique uh, when compared to some of the other signages that you see in the right of way. Uh, something else is not required, but it's nice to have a unique pole design. Uh, a lot of times the bus stop signs are put on existing signage, existing poles or a light pole, um, you know, just other signage in the right of way. And, and that's fine. But if you have a visual impairment and you're unable to know for sure where the bus stop is, if your pole is unique, when somebody goes and touches it, then they'll know that that is, uh, you know, the actual bus stop. Uh, other municipalities have also had a, a small little placard uh, with Braille or, or some unique race characters that is on the sign. And again, that's not required. And it'd be at, at hand height, but that way somebody with a visual impairment go and touch that. And then they know uh, that this is a, a bus stop and maybe what particular route is stopping here. And then we also discussed how, again, it's not a requirement, but if you have the schedule, having that on the sign in a accessible location and also having the sign downstream of the bus stop is also beneficial, but again, not uh, an ADA requirement. And then on to uh, benches. So, um, you know, when we place benches, benches are not required, but if you have them, then they need to be placed, or at least one of them needs to be placed in an accessible manner, uh, making sure that they don't get in the way of the boarding line area, um, you know, make sure they're out of that five foot by eight foot space and making sure that also they don't uh, protrude into the sidewalk and make it so people cannot get around the sidewalk in an accessible manner uh, or get to and from the boarding lighting area is also uh, a requirement. So, you know, benches are recommended in locations where headways are longer than 15 minutes. Uh, you know, but again, this is all uh, guidance. It's not a particular requirement. Uh, as you can see in the picture over here, the bus bench is in the grass, and this looks like one of the third-party advertising benches. And a lot of times we have issues with these because they're placed in a non-accessible manner in a location that is a lot of times at an angle. So that way the advertising can be seen by the drivers, but not necessarily the benches being accessed by the people who need them. So while this one is not at a 45 degree angle, it is off in the grass. So somebody in a wheelchair, somebody in a walker is not necessarily able to go and access it appropriately. Uh, adjacent to the bench, you need to have a 30 by 48 inch space. So somebody in a wheelchair could potentially transfer over to the bench if they want to, or somebody in a walker can. Uh, and all that needs to be on a firm, stable, slip resistant surface. It's important to realize that the ADA doesn't specify what this firm, stable, slip resistant surface is. Uh, but my interpretation is that grass, sand do not count as that. Um, we like to have uh, cement, have asphalt, although in, in some cases, I suppose, you know, poured in place rubber uh, or hard plastic or other materials could potentially act as that surface. But if you make it cement, you make it asphalt, then there's definitely no, um, no trouble accessing it as long as it's firm, stable, slip resistant, it's level, and you don't have any sort of um, vertical protrusions. So the uh, the benches themselves, um, they're they're governed by the Florida Administrative Code, at least here in Florida. Uh, as I mentioned, you need to go make sure that you have a space adjacent to the bench. You need to make sure that you ha leave enough clearance. Uh, in Florida, it's a four feet clearance, uh, although the ADA specifies 36 inches generally. But you are going to need to make sure you use whatever is the most restrictive policy in your municipality, uh, making sure that they are outside of the uh, the clear zone. Uh, which is similar to what happened with that example with the shelters in Polk County where they are too close, although that was the shelters, this is the um, the benches. Um, and, you know, again, making sure that they don't obstruct the boarding line area. 
Another item too to keep in mind, although not necessarily an ADA requirement, is making sure that they're in a location where people can see them from the roadway. Uh, people would feel more comfortable, whether it's the shelter, whether it's the benches, that they are in more of a lit area and not in the dark, in an unlit area, uh, behind a bush or something. You know, people just feel more safe using transit, using the benches, using the infrastructure if they uh, can be seen by by the passing cars. And they can also see the passing cars too, uh, in case there's any, uh, you know, car, uh, you know, accident that they need to be aware of. So, and again, kind of reiterating some of these things, um, you know, making sure the bench is on a, you know, firm, stable, slip resistant area. Uh, as Amanda mentioned, if you have more than one bench, it's not required that they all be accessible. So in one of her examples, you had a bench that was in a shelter and that bench was presumably accessible, but then you had a third party bench off in the grass. And while ideally all the benches would be accessible as long as you have one of them uh, located on the firm, stable, slip resistant surface, then that's really all that is required according to the ADA. Um, the the Florida Accessibility Code talks about convenience benches and making sure that we don't have too many of them in the public right of way and that only uh, benches that are authorized by the uh, transit agency are placed at the actual bus stop. Uh, there's been a lot of times where these third party uh, bench manufacturers go and kind of place them overnight. Sometimes they have permission, sometimes they don't. Uh, but if there were any sort of accessibility issues, then what we found is typically they just pull their benches up and now the transit agency is the one who is left with trying to go and make sure that everything is accessible and dealing with the potential lawsuits um, after the fact, even though they never even placed the third party benches there. So the ADA goes into uh, the requirements of the actual bench in terms of how it needs to support at least 250 pounds. Uh, there's different height width requirements, uh, the height of the back, the, um, the height of the, um, the seat area. Uh, the armrests are not required according to the ADA. However, some people with disabilities find it easier to, to use. Somebody in a walker would find it easier because they can go and use the armrest to lift themselves and lower themselves onto the bench. Somebody in a wheelchair will find the armrest more difficult because they are going to have more of a difficult time transferring to the bench from the side. Uh, so that's really up to you as to whether or not you want to include them or not in um, in your bus stop. One thing that is required is having a back to the benches. Uh, in this case, you have a back that's attached to this bench. However, if you have the bench within a shelter or against a wall, then that shelter or that wall could potentially be uh, utilized as the back, assuming that it meets all the dimensional requirements about how far away it is. And something else that I did not mention is while having the benches fixed in place is not a requirement, it is something we found um, to be ideal because a lot of times the patrons or maybe the advertising agency uh, will move the benches after the fact or a car can hit them. Uh, having them fixed in place ensures that they're going to be in an accessible manner all the time and not accessible today and then get moved and then all of a sudden not be accessible um, later on and cause any sort of accessibility issues. And over here, we have a couple of examples of benches. Some of them are third party, some of them are placed by the transit agency. Uh, these are at Dixon and As Asbury. Um, as you can see over here, uh, this is a bench that's in the grass. It doesn't appear like it's accessible, but it looks like there is one here in the shelter that is an accessible bench. Uh, and then the same thing over here, you have the accessible bench in the shelter. It has the back to it, and then it looks as if there would be the uh, clear sp floor space, 30 by 40 inch space adjacent to the bench and within the shelter. And this third party bench up here, it's in the grass, it's not accessible. There's no firm, stable, slip resistant surface to it. There's no space adjacent to it. And then on top of that, it looks like the bench is falling apart too. Brian? This is yes. Laura. A question has popped up in the question box asking what would be the requirements when a system user adds benches or chairs to a pad or shelter? When a system user adds them? Um, well, I, I mean, I guess the requirements would be that you have the, um, let's see if I can go back here. And Brian, if you don't mind me jumping in, I'll, I'll, sure. I'll answer just a little bit from the perspective of the transit system. 
um, the, if, if referring to a passenger as a system user, um, it would be very unlikely that a passenger um, will be allowed to install a bench themselves. Um, we've had cases where it has happened, but as Brian mentioned earlier, very likely it will be something that's not compliant. And one of the biggest concerns is that it's it has to be uh, stable because the um, the benches that that we've found are where a person can tip back easy and fall backwards. So that was that's a, a big concern of ours. So they would be likely removed as a result. Um, however, when working with uh, advertising firm or whether it be a local municipality or, or, or you know, like the JCs as have gone in other places. At these times, it would be the requirement that it was um, put on a cement pad as uh, shown in other cases, uh, other slides, and that once again, that it be accessible. So all the same requirements uh, as you saw on the earlier slides would need to happen to make sure that the bench is, is put in. So an example like the ones that are shown now would be the specific requirements if it is to be done correctly. As heard a moment ago, benches just get slapped down. We, we find benches being put out almost on a daily basis that we were unaware of. And it was a uh, local realtor is the advertising. We don't know who put it out there, but the local realtor is, is who's being advertised. We have to contact them to then find out who uh, installed the bench, then have it removed. Uh, if not, we work with the local municipalities to then go out and have it removed because we can't ourselves remove these because we don't have the jurisdiction. But uh, when it's not compliant, we try to make sure that it doesn't continue to be uh, a, a, a issue for not only liability, but also for, once again, um, the patrons that use the service. All right. Well, thank you, Terry. Um, we should also point out that the, I think it's the Florida Administrative Code says that the benches need to be put out with permission from the uh, transit agency. And so if a system user were to just go and put a bench out there, then presumably they have not received permission from the transit agency and therefore it would not be appropriate to put there in the first place or, or should be removed. Uh, one one example, although maybe not a system user necessarily, but there was a, an accessibility lawsuit in uh, Pinellas County for P PSTA a while ago, where a third party advertising bench vendor placed a whole bunch of buses or bus benches up and down US 19 corridor and they were not compliant. And so there was a lawsuit about the non-compliant benches and they sued the uh, advertising agency. They sued all the different cities, municipalities, uh, PSTA, uh, the, you know, the transit agency, FDOT, and the everybody more or less backed out, uh, saying that it wasn't their responsibility. Uh, the advertising agency pulled up all their benches and said they don't have their non-compliant benches there anymore, so it's not their problem, and PSTA ended up having to go and fix a lot of the, or fix all the stops in a very short period of time uh, because of the non-compliance issue from this bench vendor. So I'd be hesitant to allow a user to go and place a, a bench at a bus stop because if that's the case and it's not compliant, then the transit agency is presumably the one who's going to go and have to deal with the fallout from it if anything were to happen. Okay, Brian, there's a follow-up question also regarding the benches themselves. Is there any requirements for dividers in the seating area of the bench? There are no requirements for dividers according to the ADA. Uh, I look at that like the the handrails or, or um, you know the railing where it's beneficial for somebody with a walker to have the divider to have the hand railing to, to be able to push themselves up um, thank you but like you can see over here uh, the primary primary reason why we see them is to prevent people from sleeping on the benches um, but there's no accessibility um, requirement to have them However, as I did mention, it is controversial having them or not having them because wheelchair users don't like having any of these things because it makes it more difficult for them to transfer. People with walkers appreciate them because it makes it easier for them to go in and transfer. All right, well, thank you for the questions. And if you have any more, please feel free to type them in. 
I think I left off on this one. In this case, it's an advertising bench, which appears to be placed in a compliant manner. It's on a firm staple slip resistant surface or um, you know, adjacent to it. You have the clear floor space, a 30 by 40 inch space for somebody to transfer over here. Uh, it does not interfere with the boarding line area, although it looks like there's no raised curb here. But again, that's not a requirement. It's just something that's nice to have. And then that leads to a connection to the sidewalk. Uh, the garbage can, I guess, is the only thing that I might mention. It's a little bit far away. It's hard to tell from here, uh, from the smooth, stable, slip resistant surface. So depending on how far away it is, it may present an obstacle for somebody in a wheelchair, somebody in a walker to go and throw trash away. Uh, so ideally, that would be directly adjacent to it. But aside from that, it appears to be a generally compliant bus stop, assuming everything is level and, and the spaces are appropriate. Brian, we've had another question about benches come up. Sure. Asking if there are any rules regarding alternative beach or seating styles, um, similar to like sim seats. The, the sim, sim seats are not ADA compliant. Uh, they don't have an appropriate back. Uh, the dimensions don't meet the ADA requirements for them. However, as long as you have an ADA compliant bench, then you can have those semi seats, sim seats um, available as well to other users who are not necessarily covered by the ADA. So again, if you remember one of the, the previous slides where we had uh, an ADA compliant bench within a shelter and you had a non ADA compliant or non compliant bench off in the grass, that would be the same same methodology to use for, for these semi seats is you know you can have them as long as you also have an accessible alternative available as well. Yeah, his, his follow up comment was that the park benches don't have a back on them and are park benches non ADA compliant. That's a very good point. Um, and when we do ADA assessments of parks and of zoos and other things, and, and we do notice that the ADA. Um, if you look at, at the bench section, it talks about how the benches, and I don't have it in front of me, I apologize, uh, but they're really only applicable for transit stops, uh, for locker rooms, um, I believe for saunas, for restaurants. There's, there's a few specific requirements where those benches are required, and it doesn't mention parks uh, or a lot of other locations either. So our interpretation is that those benches uh, don't meet the, those benches are not required to meet the requirements listed in the ADA because the ADA says that those are not, um, th those those benches, those locations for benches are not listed. Uh, so therefore they're not required to go meet them. So it is always nice to have backs on the benches, um, but I wouldn't say that it's a requirement. It's more of a, uh, more of a human centric type of item to include uh, if you want to have them. Uh, something like PROAG uh, and, and possibly other local standards and you know whenever things like this get introduced then they might provide additional guidance on that but right now uh, it nothing is required for park benches so if there's no other questions then Sarah has another mentee question for everybody all righty so let's jump over. Oh, there we go. So great discussion on benches, and um, glad that we that Brian was able to answer some questions. Um, so as a follow up, like our other ones, what are some of the characteristics of an ADA compliant bench? And Brian, um, I did see one other question that popped in. Does it say that benches must have a back? So while we have um, the mentee coming in, um, could you answer that? Benches for bus stops and, and for the locations where they are required for the ADA need to have a back of some sort. However, having a back, ha having an independent back to the bench is not necessarily required. The, the back could be the back of the shelter or it could be the back of a brick wall or a fence, assuming that the dimensional requirements and the spacing is appropriate. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we have preferred to be anchored slash non-movable 
railings, firm, stable, slip resistant, um, 74 inch bench dimensions, bench placed in a compliant clear space, at least able to support 250 pounds, um, placed only at agency authorized transit stops, must have a back with a minimum 18 inch high, minimum distance from roadway, must be installed on a stable slip resistant surface, preferred to be anchored, armrests that allow accessibility. These are all great answers. So with that, I will turn it back over to Brian. Thank you. And remember the armrests are not a requirement, but they are nice to have. So next we're going to move on to construction um, work zones in terms of uh, how they apply to the ADA and bus stops. So as you can see here, this is not PS or this is not Space Coast. Um, I forget which location this is, but I like this picture because as you can see, there is a person there waiting at a bus stop and everything is torn up here. There's dirt, there's probably a, a pretty big drop from the curb uh, to the dirt and then back up again to the sidewalk. And it doesn't even look level to me either. So this is a non-compliant area and at locations where you're gonna have construction, you need to make sure that there, the accessible route is still maintained. Um, if you're gonna have a bus stop there, the bus stop still needs to be accessible during the construction. So if that's not possible, then you can, uh, you know, temporarily suspend service at the bus stop, you can move the bus stop, um, ensuring that people are given plenty of notice, but having construction is not a valid excuse to not have non-compliance. So I have another picture here. This one is in uh, Brevard County, and this is at uh, Fisk and Swiss Point Boulevard. And over here it says sidewalk is closed, but then you see further down the sidewalk, there is a, uh, a bus stop. And we have some more pictures of it here. Uh, this is in the same general area. You know, it's saying detour. Uh, it has some cones here, but I'm not sure if uh, appropriate notice is given. Uh, you have to imagine that, you know, it's easy enough as me as an able-bodied person to walk across the street, see that I can't get by, maybe walk on the grass or turn around but somebody in a wheelchair is gonna have more difficulty. And according to the ADA, they need to have a 60 inch turning space, it needs to be level. Uh, so if your sidewalks are not 60 inches wide, then if they get someplace and across the street, they get to a sidewalk and all of a sudden it's closed, they have to turn around, but they don't have 60 inches of space to turn around in, then that is a large barrier to accessibility for them. And then they're gonna have great difficulty, um, you know, safely maneuvering back to where they came from. And so here's another one. It says detour, sidewalk closed. You have the bus stop that appears to still be active, uh, yet the route to get to and from the bus stop is not accessible. And Brian, I just want to comment that across the street is the, the crosswalk that you're seeing is actually the main crosswalk for an elementary school. And, and so this is definitely not planned with all users in mind. And thank you, Sarah. Um, something else to point out too is the pedestrian push button. Um, that's something else is not necessarily part of the bus stop, but you know, ensuring that things like that are accessible uh, when you are placing your bus stop. You know, making sure that if you're going to be adding a sidewalk, that that, that is reachable from a firm, stable, sl slip-resistant surface. Uh, in this case, with the construction all around it, it's definitely not reachable. Um, and then also, as you can see, the lack of a curb ramp, lack of technical warnings which may be fine because it's a construction site, but ensuring that there's an alternative way for people to get to the bus stop and you know, to the elementary school as well is, is um, definitely a requirement. Brian, if you don't mind me uh, jumping in there again. So sure. this location that we're, we're viewing is not at an actual bus stop. It is a good couple of yards away from the bus stop. You know, the, the two pictures, mm -hmm. although uh, as you can probably see in the background where the bus stop is, um, this entire area is is under construction for a sidewalk project. So um, there are good pictures to show and hopefully we can show afters later on, but uh, um, you see the proximity to the bus stop. And the reason why I brought that up is because one of the biggest questions I have always asked is, you know, at what point um, is it relational to the bus stop itself? 
and not relational because this is probably about what 40 ish 45 feet away from the physical bus stop where you have the sidewalk now closed and the um, pedestrian crosswalk Well, and so Terry brings up a good point that, you know, the bus stop is still still there. It's still the way that it was that, you know, it's it's now, you know, I, ideally, I guess it's the county's responsibility to ensure that an accessible route is maintained there or at least to notify the transit agencies. That way you can make sure that the bus stop is relocated to a more appropriate location. But if somebody with disability is not able to get to and from that location, whether it's the bus stop or whether it's a school, some alternative means need to be um, in place. You know, whether that's relocating the bus stop or making sure that there is, you know, for the school, making sure there's another crosswalk available so somebody can still get there because those are still active locations used by people with disabilities and without disabilities. Uh, so they need to be sure that there is some sort of accessibility available to them. Or again, if the amenity is, if the bus stop is removed altogether uh, during construction, then there's nothing to not be accessible. And that is also a valid um, way of fixing the problem. Okay, thank you. So this is uh, another location. This is at uh, Fisk and Lowe's. And you know, again, we have the bus stop. It looks like it has the raised curb and a five foot bay footboard and line area. Uh, the sign is downstream of the boarding line area, so all this is great. But then you have the barricade that says sidewalk closed, although it looks like it's also possibly been moved by some pedestrians and people are still utilizing it. So in this case, if the the sidewalk could still be closed, you know, going this direction, but maybe it's open the other direction, in which case that's still fine. Uh, people can still access the bus stop and can still get to and from it, even if they can't necessarily get to the far side of it. Uh, the issue with this one is probably more in lines with uh, the plans review and, and construction of it is that they have this rather decent sized slope right here in the sidewalk that uh, I believe Sarah mentioned ended up being acceptable. Although again, it's not ideal to have the slope here um, if it's not really warranted. Hey, having it be a more flat surface makes things easier makes things more accessible for everybody uh, whether or not you have a disability having a flat is is better obviously uh, and then you can see the construction barricades around the sidewalk but not blocking the sidewalk yeah it's it's only acceptable because of the um construction um tolerances which i know you're about to get into <laughs> yep that's a good segue for the next couple of slides So now we're going to go into plans review, uh, unless anybody has any questions about construction um, and, and bus stops. So uh, we have all, all these different items that we looked at in terms of accessibility previously. And the issue that the reason why I still have a job, though, is because things are still built incorrectly now even after the idea has been into place for for many years um, some of that's because things are designed incorrectly some of it's because they might be designed correctly but then they are built incorrectly by the construction workers or they just fall out of compliance due to uh, the age and the wear and tear of the structure so we're going to talk about things to look for when you're reviewing plans or when you're designing plans and and ways that we can you know ensure that things are compliant um, you know at least when they're built uh, because there's really nothing worse than you know having to build something and then having to go and fix it again soon after it's already been constructed because it was done incorrectly. Uh, a few things to remember is that uh, you know the construction could trigger ADA compliance. Uh, the ADA, like Amanda said, was uh, enacted in 1990 with an effective date in 1992, and then there was a newer version in 2010 with the effective date in 2012. So anything that was built prior to 1992 or prior to 2012 would or anything built prior to 2012 would fall into play under the 1990 guidelines anything built prior to 1992 uh, don't necessarily have to meet ada guidelines until the time when changes are made uh, or modifications are made to that bus stop or to that building or park or whatever it is 
so if you were to have a, a sign on the ground, and even if paratransit is not necessarily available at that location, if that sign was in the ground at the location and it hasn't been touched since 1990, then it's technically acceptable the way it is. Although it's definitely not ideal because uh, you know you'd, you'd like to make things accessible and like to make things uh, easier to use for everybody. Uh, if it hasn't been touched, then it's acceptable at that point in time until which time when it is modified. And one thing, um, you know, one time when that happened was in Volusia County, there was a bunch of bus stops signs in the ground. They weren't necessarily accessible, but they were acceptable because of how long they had been there. And FDOT expanded the roadway. Um, from my understanding of the story, they ripped out all the signs, they modified the road, they put all the signs back, but they didn't make them uh, accessible bus stops and because everything has been modified now they need to be modified they need to be made accessible um, and that wasn't necessarily done the first time then things were worked out between Voltran and FGOT and, and they ended up fixing them but just making sure that if you touch something that then you make it accessible is, is the main point of this so we're going to look at a couple different plans and some observations that I have made about them and, and kind of go from there. Uh, so this is for 520 and Kiwanis. Uh, and, and, you know, generally the um, the plans look okay to me. Uh, the BNA is larger or, or longer than what's required. Um, I like how the slopes specify over here. It says 1.5% as opposed to 2% is the, uh, the maximum uh, slope. Uh, or cross slope for a bus stop or for a sidewalk. And so by having the slopes less than the maximum requirements, then you do have some leeway in case uh, when they're constructed, they're constructed slightly out of tolerance. Since the ADA doesn't allow for any sort of construction tolerances, um, you know, 2% is 2%. If it's over 2%, then it's not technically ADA compliant. Um, you know, for the cross slope. So by specifying things that are less than the maximum requirements, then you do allow for some wiggle room uh, during the construction of them. Uh, so I also, I don't think we mentioned too, is the, the slope of the boarding and lighting area. We say level, um, I mean, this is Florida. So generally the roadways are fairly level throughout the majority of the state. However, I know we do have some visitors from other states as well where things might be a little bit more hilly. So in, in these cases, you want to make sure that the uh, the slope parallel to the roadway is ideally it's level. However, and it should be, you know, generally the slope uh, or the, the slope parallel to the roadway on the boarding lighting area should be the slope of the roadway. And the reason for that is if you were to have a bus that stop that's on the hill and the bus is on the hill and it deploys its ramp, then you want to make sure that the ramp is flush with the boarding and lighting area. If uh, the two slopes are different, then there's a possibility that they're not going to be um, flush and you're going to have some sort of tripping hazard at the junction between or the transition between uh, the boarding and lighting area and, and the ramp to the bus. Um, but the area in this case that would be, uh, sorry if I, perpendicular to the road, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, I can't remember now. Perpendicular to the road would be 2% maximum. Parallel to the road would be the slope of the roadway. Uh, for sidewalks and for the rest of the, the boarding lane or the rest of the um, the bus stop pad, uh, the, the shelters, all that, then the cross slope, which is perpendicular to the direction of travel, needs to be a 2% maximum slope. So I'm, I'm sorry if all those numbers confuse everybody, but we also have them um, you know, listed here too, and they're also specified in the ADA. So uh, again, in this one, they have the slope slightly less than the re maximum requirements, and there's plenty of room to move around in. It looks like they have a shelter here, and this is the one you can see in this corner that had the uh, the bike rack. It had the nice blue shelter and the um, tire pressure pump in it. And, oh, sorry, here's the uh, a closer version of it. So the slopes are less um, and plenty of room for people to go and maneuver within the uh, the shelter and to the existing sidewalk. And then again, the raised curb over here, where it slopes down um, each side of the boarding line area. And here is a, another bus stop. Um, this one, you can see up here, it, um, 
it's again from 520 and Kiwanis. Uh, let's see, this is talking about the construction plans, um, you know, or, or ensuring that everything is built appropriately um, and, and still appropriate during construction, that they have the, the right signage um, in place for drivers while they're, uh, while they're constructing it. And then the slope of the roadways, again, this is kind of hard to see, or I'm sorry, the slope of the sidewalk, the Portland line area, how it's showing here, 2% max, you know, but ideally you would have it slightly less than the maximum allowable slope uh, to allow for construction tolerances. So this next one, uh, they have a 2% maximum slope and 5% maximum slope and 8.3%. 3% maximum slope, and those are the maximum allowable according to the ADA. So if the contractor is able to construct this to an 8.3% slope or 5% slope or 2% slope, then everything's fine. Or if they construct it less than that, then that's fine too. However, a lot of times this is where non-compliant issues come into play because they are not able to construct it exactly to these specifications and it's slightly steeper than that, in which case the bus stop could potentially be constructed brand new and still not be accessible to somebody in a wheelchair, somebody in a walker, uh, because of the higher slopes. You know, so again, having these less than the maximum requirements is beneficial uh, to ensure that you have an ADA compliant uh, bus stop and borderline area and sidewalk. Now, this is uh, some plans for a curb ramp, and you know, generally everything is fine with this. One, it has the detectable warnings. They are 24 inches deep. They stretch the entire width of the curb ramp. You have a level landing at the top of them. Uh, the slope was less than the minimum requirements, but the one thing I don't like about this one is that uh, they say it's a handicap ramp. And handicap is more of a derogatory term. Uh, for you know, We prefer to call them people with disabilities or even just call it a ramp, call it a curb ramp. You don't need the word handicap in there at all. Um, but the derivation of that word is from, you know, 100 or so years ago when people with disabilities were unable to go and get a job, they would be out on the streets uh, with their cap in hand begging for money. And, and that's why it's um, more considered derogatory nowadays. We try not to use that. And so here again, the slopes are less than the requirements, which is good. Uh, and then we have some other construction plans. Uh, these are not done in CAD, so there's some issues uh, assessing them because we're unsure exactly what the slopes might be. Uh, these are done by some of the bench vendors uh, throughout the state. And you know, while they have what appears to be you know a raised curb and a boarding line area that looks like it might be a sufficient space, there's a, a pretty what appears to be a pretty big slope. Uh, from the curb to the sidewalk. And so unless this was raised up dramatically or some modifications were done to the sidewalk to lower the sidewalk or make this into a ramp, then there's a potential that either the boarding lighting area is not gonna be um, level and not be compliant or potentially the ramp from the boarding lighting area to the sidewalk might be too steep. And then also uh, ensuring that the bench is not in this particular location because right now, if it were to remain here, then there'd be no connection, no accessible connection from the boarding line area to the sidewalk. So ensuring that the bench removed, uh, you know, perhaps over here, and that all this would level or is level would be um, ideal. And then again, having the sign, although not required, but having it on the side of the boarding line area would be better to allow for the drivers to know exactly where they need to go and stop their vehicle. And we have another. Uh, one of these diagrams where in this case, assuming that everything is level, uh, all they really need to do to pave the boarding line area and make it compliant is pave a small little strip of grass right here. And then between that strip of grass and the sidewalk and potentially some of this space up here, you would have a compliant boarding line area. It looks like you have a bench over here that might be compliant and then potentially another third party bench too that looks like it's gonna be on a firm, stable, slip resistant surface in which case you could potentially have two benches that are compliant, which is even better than the minimum requirements. And then the last example of this is another one of these sketches. Uh, you know, again, ensuring, ideally ensuring that you have a raised curb is beneficial, although not required. 
you have the schedule and the, um, the sign, it's on the downstream side of the board and line area, which is you know good. Making sure the bench is located in a location where it's not going to be blocking the board and line area. It doesn't block access to the sidewalk and also doesn't block the sidewalk itself. Uh, and again, also making sure all this is level. Uh, you know, assuming this is all level, then this would generally be uh, an acceptable, accessible location. So then just kind of in review, when you're looking at these plans, you know, again, making sure that you do account for construction tolerances, that you have slopes ideally that are less than the maximum requirements uh, in case there are mistakes done during construction, that way the bus stop can still be the, um, accessible. Uh, you know, making sure you have the, the five foot for boarding line area, making sure that if there's any amenities, which again, the amenities are not required, but if you have them, that they are placed in an accessible manner. And you have a nice, what appears to be accessible bus stop here with the, or actually maybe not an accessible bus stop because I, I'm guessing the bench is probably within the boarding line area. Um, so if this bench were moved maybe over here, then it might be a little bit better location, but you have uh, a raised curb, you have a boarding line area, uh, there's a ramp that goes down here, detectable warnings that alert people um, who are gonna be using the shoulder roadway as the accessible route. Uh, the sign is on the downstream side. Uh, and you know again, this is high contrast. So with a little modification, I think this can be made accessible. And now we're gonna be looking at two bus stops virtually and trying to see um, what what all of you think um, can be done or what's good, what's bad about them. Uh, these are, you know, we're in Brevard County here for those of you who are not familiar with the area and these are gonna be over in the Cocoa Beach area. So we have uh, these two different stops that Sarah's gonna be showing on a video in just a minute. And then I think we're gonna mute everybody and, and see what everyone thinks about them. Yep, so it's um, Coco and Rockledge are the the two stops. It's the area that we'll be looking at today. So we have um, never done anything quite like this before, so hopefully this won't turn into a anarchy, but basically we're going to show the video and then um, we'll make it where you guys are unmuted, where you can mute and, or mute and unmute yourself to comment or you can put something in the question box, however you feel comfortable um, commenting. But basically the idea behind it is that we are going to simulate a field review um, through video and you'll have the opportunity to kind of use all the skills and, and knowledge that we just gave you over um, you know, the last hour or two to be able to assess a bus stop. So let me pull up the first one, which is located at Florida Ave and Bougainvillea Drive. All right, so you should be able to, well, maybe not. You should be able to mute. I thought I said we, this is the first time we tried this, so I apologize. Okay, it does not look like I can like mute and unmute you. Um, you just need to raise your hand if you'd like to comment is, is the way we're going to have to do it. So what did you notice on this bus stop? All right, Marvin Jones, I've unmuted you. So you should be able to unmute yourself and comment. Yeah, I noticed that the 
Well, with some work, that stop may be uh, ADA accessible. It looks like it at one time might have been, but there's too much signage um, where those small little pads are at, but they're not connected to the sidewalk. Um, to me, the stop is just like, not the stop itself, but uh, it needs some work to get back to our thing. Awesome, thank you. We also had some comments where not flat grass is in the way, uh, oh, not flat, the grass is in the way, um, the signs in the way. Any other things that we noticed about this bus stop? Dimensions are wrong. All right, I'm going to unmute Levi. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Hello. Hello. Oh, uh, the only thing I was going to say is there's no five by eight burning lighting pad, just, just the uh, uh, sidewalk, but I don't see clearly a five by eight. Also, the bench don't have clear space on, on the sides for a wheelchair to transfer to it. Um, yep, so that's those, those are my comments. Awesome, thank you. We also in the chat box have no visual impaired warning pads and um, none of the detectable warning mats. Bench is inaccessible, no accessible path between bench and boarding area, which is also not stable and firm. Curbs are not ADA compliant, grass needs a sidewalk. We'll just give a couple more minute or two if anyone else would like to comment and then Brian's going to walk us through the bus stop. All right, thank you guys for commenting. So Brian, I'm going to start the video for you to walk us through. Remember you will um, it'll the video will mute you, so you'll have to unmute yourself again. All right, sorry about that. It uh, wouldn't let me unmute myself. Oh so, no, you want me to restart the video? Um, I, I can probably talk about it from this angle. Okay, it's fine all too. Right. So I think everybody uh, pretty much covered most of the items that I would have discussed is, um, I mean, you all noticed that the boarding line area, it's made from grass and it didn't have the, the raised uh, you know, six inch curb. It didn't have the firm, stable, slip resistant surface. Uh, there was no, connection to the sidewalk, um, the bench, obviously. Ryan, I think you're, I think you're unmuted now. Oh, all right, I'm some, back again. Something happened with the... Too, too many Yep, technical yep, difficulties. Yep, exactly. I apologize. No, that that's fine. Um, so the bench was not in an accessible location, although it was on a firm stable slip resistant surface being on the asphalt, it ideally should not be in a parking lot like that. It should be separated from that, be connected to the bus stop and to the sidewalk a little bit better. Uh one thing that we didn't really go over in this presentation that is a whole nother topic altogether, but 
if that location for the bus stop is so bad, then perhaps even relocating the bus stop to another location, um, you know, perhaps closer to the signal, you know, trying to figure out where are people going, you know, before you spend all this money trying to fix this bus stop at this location, is it at the best location? I mean, it happens to be that it's right outside of a fire station. And so maybe that is a good location because that's a safe space. Uh, there might be other activities that people attend in that location. Uh, but if not, then maybe moving it closer to the signal. Uh, a lot of times we recommend on the far side of the signal, but you know, again, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, you know, but lo relocating the bus stop is another alternative too, and maybe you'll find another location that is safer and cost less money to make accessible in the first place. Uh, Terry, did you have anything else to add about that one? I'm sorry, same, Chris, I couldn't unmute myself either. Sorry about that. Um, this was definitely a, a stop that was worth taking a look at. Uh, one of those cases where we call that a bandit bench where it was put out there, it was moved around. Um, uh, however, as as mentioned by everyone in the group, it's, it's not a compliant location. Even while we're doing the site visit, the discussion was being had of relocating the bus stop closer to the intersection uh, in the interim because the potential trip hazards and everything that is associated with this stop. So it's something that we're looking at. I, I wanna say that we have requested that the, um, the uh, locates be done for relocating the actual physical bus stop pole. Um, and we're waiting for that to come back now. One of the bigger concerns as Brian pointed out earlier in the discussion is when you relocate, if it, if it had been there from since before 1990, it's almost grandfather, but relocating now we have to make it a compliant location. But in some cases, it's in our best interest to relocate the sign and then go through the process of making the pad and board and lighting pad, I'm sorry, having the board and lighting pad installed afterwards to minimize the potential hazards that the pedestrian or the passenger will have utilizing this location as it is now. So, but yeah, we we identified it as a definitely a potential problem stop, and are working to get it uh, relocated from there, and more than likely without the bench going with it, because it definitely would not be a compliant location to have a bench on the grass. Thank you, Terry. All right, thank you, Brian and Terry and everyone who participated. I will pull up our second location, which is Florida Ave and Orange Street. All right, so what did you notice on this one? Once again, you can use the question box or um, you can raise your hand and Laura will unmute you. All right, it looks like uh, Monica Gonzalez is You, Monica, you should be able to um, unmute yourself. Oh, 
and went back down. Um, so, oh, there we go. We can hear you now. Hey, good morning. So I really like the way the, the bus stop, I mean, the bench was, you know, set back away from the, the curb. It was a safe distance away from the street, but still was able to see the oncoming traffic. And it just looks like a, to me, it looks like a pretty perfect bus stop. But of course I know it's probably not, <laughs> probably something wrong. They, they never are perfect, are they? <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Monica. I also see um, Stephen Harris has his hand up. Stephen, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, it looks like the bench is obstructing the sidewalk. It seems to be protruding into the, into the sidewalk. And there's also no room for a wheelchair here. Now, if the grass can were moved, perhaps a wheel, there would be room for a wheelchair there. But right now, I don't see room for a wheelchair. That's an excellent point, Stephen. And yeah, it does stick out a little. I realize in the video, you can't quite get that physical, you know, aspects necessarily because you're not actually there. But um, yep, it does stick out just a little bit into the sidewalk. Thank you. Um, I thought I saw another hand. Now I don't see it. Oh, there we go. Uh, it popped up on Marvin Jones. Marvin, you can unmute yourself. Hey, good morning again. I don't see any of the slip resistance markers or stop pads. I agree with the uh, gentleman about the bench. The bus stop sign to me looks like it's leaning to the left. That should might be readjusted because when the lady walked by uh, with the wheel, with the baby stroller, had she been any closer, she looked like she might have bumped into it uh, and maybe not even intentionally, but as it's just a couple of things. I like the stop, but uh, like I said, the stops are great. They, they, they just, uh, most of the stops, most of any bus stops, and a lot of them all need something, but this one just to me, I don't see any slip resistant markers. So when we, um, thank you, Marvin. So when we play the video again, um, if you, I'm not sure you can actually see it in the video, but there, there is at the curb, um, the slippers, the, um, oh. yeah, the truncated domes or slip resistant, um, okay. you know, the mats are located there. Um, we did actually have a discussion where it appeared that there needed to be one more mat added because it's a very, large um, curve around, you know, turn there, and, and they have the curb very sloped, like a lot of it is sloped. So um, let's look at some of our comments that came in on the question, bo question box. We have benches blocking part of the main sidewalk, no visually impaired pad and boarding ramp, nowhere for the wheelchair to sit, possibly not enough space to get around bench on sidewalk bench inaccessible, no accessible path between bench and boarding and a lighting pad, which is also not stable and firm. Curbs are not ADA compliant. Oh, wait, hold on. I somehow got backed up on my comments. Um, slope on the sidewalk looks too steep. Better than the previous one, but bench is too far away. No direct path to enter the path. It is angled at the location a user would board the bus and speed limit sign is in the way. The slope, move bus sign downstream, no ADA warning mat signs. All right, so I am going to um, start the video again and let's see, Brian, if this works this time for you to talk through it. All right, I looks like I can talk right now. So as you're coming up here, it looks like you do have a raised curb and you have a boarding lane area that you know, appears to be at least more than five feet by eight feet. Uh, the sign is tilted a little bit. And if I remember right, I think we did try to make it straight after we took the video. 
something that's important to know is that something called protruding objects, which we only talked about briefly for something that's sign mounted, it can be twelve inches away. i mean ideally it's less. we don't want people to hit their head even if it is ada compliant, but you are allowed to have a twelve inch protrusion from from a post like that the detectable warnings you can kind of see over there by the crosswalk on the far side um they are required at locations where the curb ramp is is flush with the roadway uh, you know typically that's it's a small little Sorry, Brian, it muted you when I start restarted the video. I apologize. I'm just turning the video off. <laughs> okay. Um, here, should we, can we pause it here? Oh, or... here. I just turned it off so oh, that we okay. can. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I'm sorry, uh, I got cut off. So detectable warnings are required at the curb ramps at the areas with the, the flush shoulder, um, you know, to the roadway or the flush section to the roadway. Usually they're 36 inches, 48 inches wide. But in locations like this one, where you have an entire corner um, that's flush with the roadway and, and all that generally acts as a curb ramp, then the entire area uh, that doesn't have the curb needs to have detectable warnings because you don't want somebody with a visual impairment to not realize that they are going to be walking straight into traffic, even if it's not necessarily uh, the correct location, you know, adjacent to the crosswalk. So I, I think that stop was missing one or two small sections of tech warning, but generally it was there. Uh, something else too, just to clarify, is that in some locations I've seen, um, not in Brevard, but they have, some people have inadvertently put detectable warnings at the board and light area. Uh, but that again is something it's not required. And in fact, it would cause confusion to people with uh, a visual impairment. Uh, they're required at, at curb ramps, obviously, at, uh, at locations where you have the transition to the roadway. Uh, I think the reason why people put them there is because at, at rail stations they are required along the entire uh, rail platform boarding platform. Um, but the reason for that really is because you would generally have a large drop and you want to make sure people don't fall down onto the tracks. But at, at bus stops they are are not required um, over there. Uh, a few other notes that I took on this. Um, so we talked about the sign leaning, the schedule look like it, it probably should be shifted or turned 90 degrees to just to make it a little bit more accessible to people who are on the sidewalk. Uh, the bench, as a few people pointed out, it's great that it was up there, it's out of the way of the sidewalk, but it is, or it does appear to be a little bit in the way of people heading to City Hall, which was that location to the right. Um, also, if the bench were shifted back a little bit, you know, again, it's on a firm, stable, slip resistant surface. It has the clear floor space adjacent to it. But if it were shifted back a little bit more, then you would have more cement surface in front of it, which would just make things a little bit more accessible, a little bit easier to use for somebody in a walker um, or even somebody who is able-bodied to access it and ensure that they have enough space in front of it to, to get tuned from the bench. Uh, one other item too, and again, um, it doesn't necessarily apply to this bus stop, but you saw the uh, the park car on street parking just in front of the bus stop. Um, if this bus stop were located 10, 20 feet, um, you know, further down the roadway, uh, as I've seen in, in lots of other locations too, it may be accessible when there's no cars there because the bus would pull into the the on street parking. But as soon as you have a couple of cars parked there, now all of a sudden the bus stop is not accessible because now people need to somehow get off the curb through the parked cars and then onto the, the bus. So in cases like that, having it located you know, where it is is great or also having maybe a bulb out uh, in front of or, or behind some spaces. So that way you can ensure that people can properly access the bus while it's on the street if there is no no curb uh, or pull out for it, then, then that would be good. Uh, Sarah, were, were there any other questions or comments that people had about that one that I did not cover? Not, nope. I don't see any additional. Um, so um, at this time, we are kind of, we're starting to wrap up. We have a couple more slides that um, help provide resources and, and one more mentee. But um, we wanted to kind of take a pause and see now that we've gone through the process of, um, you know, the various trainings and then do, doing the kind of wrap up project of, 
a virtual field review. Thank you guys for playing along. As I said, that was our, our first time ever trying something like that. I think it was fairly good other than the muting and unmuting. Um, and so at this time, does anyone have any questions for Brian or Amanda regarding the information presented today? And you can either put those in the question box or raise your hand if you'd feel more comfortable that way, whatever your preference is. We'll just give it a couple couple minutes here to make sure no one's typing. All right, so with that, I'm going to pull up our last mentee for the day. And that is now after the training, how comfortable are you with ADA standards and compliance? So as you recall, we asked this question at the beginning of the training and let's see if it's changed. All right, so it looks like we definitely, we were mostly in the somewhat comfortable and comfortable range um, at you know the beginning of the day. And now we are definitely more in the comfortable range and more people in the more very comfortable. I think we only had like one or two in the very comfortable at the beginning. So Brian, I will turn it back over to you and Amanda to go over resources. Oh. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so as you mentioned, we're wrapping this up. Um, there's a handful of resources that might be beneficial to you. And I think all these are also listed in the handout you received, but um, you know, obviously the ADA, uh, keep in mind there's the DOT version and the DOJ version. So it really depends on what sort of facility you're looking at. Uh, obviously if it's with transportation, then the DOT version would be appropriate, but we did have a park question earlier. Uh, if you're in Florida, the FDOT design manual is another good resource and um, that and a few other documents that we'll talk about uh, sometimes have things that are a little bit more restrictive accessibility wise than the ADA. Uh, so make sure again, you use the most restrictive code uh, for your design and then you'll ensure that you are within compliance. Uh, the US Access Board has a lot of uh, good resources, uh, opinions and um, Nice graphics as well uh, that help illustrate some of these accessible uh, requirements. Um, FTA, of course, is another resource too. The Float Accessibility Code, uh, that's the other one where there are uh, some photo specific requirements that are more stringent than the ADA. There's not very many of them, uh, but it is worth uh, reviewing that as well. The Accessing transit uh, manual and update. That's something that uh, my company uh, prepared for FTOT, and it's really a combination of a bunch of different resources uh, from ADA, from the Float Accessibility Code, from the Float Design Manual, and, and others. And we kind of combine them into a nicer, easier to read uh, handbook and, and brochure that makes things, um, in my mind, better. And, and there'll also be some training for that coming up. Um, so please be on the lookout for that from DOT. The uh, Space Coast TPO ADA bus stop assessment, uh, that was another document that we prepared for uh, Space Coast Area Transit and for the TPO where we assessed all of the different bus stops and helped create that transition plan that identifies what the issues are and how to fix them. And something like that is important for all municipalities uh, to know what your non-compliant items are and something required by the DOJ and ensuring that you have a plan to in place to go in and fix them like um, Space Coast Area Transit is, is currently doing. And then if you have any questions regarding the ADA, uh, if you want to contact Brian Bradley, he's a state ADA coordinator. Uh, George Borchek uh, is for District 5, although we do have people from all over the state and all over the country. So ensuring that you, you know, find the right uh, 
DOT ADA coordinator. There should be one for each DOT, one for each of the different districts, and then also ADA coordinators for perhaps your county, for your city, for your transit agency as well. Um, and then I have my contact information, uh, Terry's and Sarah's as well, so please feel free to reach out to any of us. If you have any questions about this presentation, about ADA, about transit in general, would much rather help you now before things get constructed, um, just to ensure that things are done correctly and, and making sure that they're accessible for all of your, uh, your patrons and citizens. So thank you very much. And uh, Sarah and Terry, I think, have some closing remarks if there's no other questions. I don't see any questions right now. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Terry as he has some closing remarks and then I'll do some housekeeping items before we close out for today. Thanks a lot, Sarah. And, and really quick, everyone, once again, thanks for taking the time this morning. Um, one of the main purposes that we want to put together this training is, is particularly, uh, as Brian, and I just want to echo everything Brian just said, that particularly to make sure that uh, when design is completed, that as you're reviewing the de these designs, that you know exactly what you're looking for, because as we pointed out, there have been re recent projects that have been completed, and um, as Sarah said, it is okay for construction, but it's not um, completely compliant for the users of the service. Um, and then also Brian showed a couple of slides that, that were proposed, but if constructed would be completely non-compliant and, and in some cases even unsafe for the uh, transit users, or even pedestrians walking along the roadway or, or passing through these areas. So we really want to make sure that as you're looking at these plans that are submitted, whether it be by a bench vendor, a uh, subdivision developer, uh, in our case, you know, a hotel that is doing a project and wants to relocate a bus stop or bus shelter, whatever the case may be, they submit the plans to your agencies for review because Space Coast Area Transit works with them if we have the information in advance, but we don't review the plans. Uh, so we want to make sure that anyone that's, that's taken a look at these plans know exactly what they're looking at, know exactly what they're looking for, and can ensure the compliance is completed before the project is constructed because as Brian mentioned earlier, there are instances where the, the project has been done and then you have to go back and, and have it removed or redone. And of course, no one wants to go through that expense. So uh, thanks again and, and, and looking forward to, to working with you guys. And as he mentioned, there are several resources available to you, but if not, by all means, feel free to reach out to any of us and I'm glad to lend any assistance possible. All right, thank you, thank you, Terry. And just as some general housekeeping items before we close out, I'd like to thank you for everyone who attended from all over the country as well as also the state. Um, you know, this I do recognize that this was a very Space Coast focused um, training with our pictures, but I hope that everyone got something that you can take back and apply to your specific area. We will be uploading the recording on to our YouTube so over the next day or two. So if you are interested in sharing it, um, you know, please visit the Space Coast TPO YouTube. And we can also send that as an email follow up along with um, the PowerPoint as well if you didn't get to download it from the handout section on GoTo. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their week. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah and Brian and team.